My name is Stefan Siro. I'm Vice President of the High Tech Industry at Dassault Systems. At Dassault Systems, the high tech industry covers everything regards to high tech from semiconductors down to consumer electronics and electronics, to technology suppliers, telcos, and also in the battery uh, space. Great to meet you, Stefan. My name is Paul Armstrong. I run Hereforth, which is an emerging technology advisory. I get to work with people like Meta through to big agencies like Omnicom, helping them see round corners. That's usually about five to 10 years in the future. Let's have a chat. <laughs> Manufacturing is definitely at a tipping point. In the past few years, if anything, have just shown momentous change happening in this field. When you think about the pandemic, the resulting supply chain shortages, as one example, when you see the growing rift between China and the US, as another example, when you see also sustainability really starting to have its imprint in the manufacturing sector, when you think also of new technologies coming in the manufacturing sector, think about 5G networks, here. Um, and so definitely at a tipping point, this trend is due to continue in the years ahead. And more than that, I think leaders in this space are really realizing we're at a tipping point and that they need to embrace this change moving forward. In terms of the technologies which are really driving sustainability forward, the one that really stands out is this idea of a virtual twin. The idea that you can design, model, simulate a product in a virtual environment before putting it out on the real world and then getting that feedback from the real world back to the virtual realm where you can keep on improving it. This is a massive technological change from a sustainability perspective. Because you can engineer, you can eco-design your product to make sure that it's sustainable, or it's as sustainable as you could conceive it to be. You could also then ensure that it, you build in traceability of the components through this virtual twin and model it through the virtual twin and build that circularity before putting it out mm. on the real world. So I think that virtual twins is definitely the linchpin of how we're going to build a more sustainable uh, world in manufacturing. A, a great point. I think to that, to, to that area, if you expand that up, you've got um, uh, Singapore, for example, creating their digital twin for their whole city. And so they can see how new things work, where new materials do we, where do we put a dark factory, for example, um, so that you know, things don't have to be so uh, long time or reliant on supply chains that can break. Um, that for me is a really key area of where manufacturing can really you know, utilize new technologies in order to not just make money, but also save a lot of money too. So I think that's a really good example that you give there. Um, at a systems level, effectively, you know, you could model the city, you could model its infrastructures. And then with regards to manufacturing, you could also take it down to the product level. One of the initiatives which um, I'm looking at with most, let's say, interest is the EU uh, um, proposed directive for a digital product passport. Mm -hmm. This idea that every single product could carry its digital product passport where you would get full traceability of the materials within a product, where they come from and where they will go. That is just one example of how you could build a virtual twin onto every single product and build it through this kind of circular economy. Mm. When it comes to sort of future innovations and sort of thinking about, you know, five, ten years ahead and that sort of thing, I think it's interesting now that we're starting to see that sort of move towards product to service. I think from a manufacturing point of view, it's about time that that happens, if it's hitting it at the right time. I, um, I, I'm excited to see where that area goes and how people figure out what's the right mix for them. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to sort of uh, think about you know, AI and its impact that it can have and that it's going to have. We're still very embryonic with that um, technology for a lot of um, reality, I think. It's very overblown for a lot of people. But we are doing some smart things in, in the manufacturing industry and I think that's one of the, the most exciting things. From a consumer perspective, I see products as a service as a natural evolution and that sort of thing. How, how are you sort of coming on to that, if that makes sense? Um, so 
Moving from product to service is a fundamental trend which we've been looking at. This is not new for the past you know, 10 years. We've seen this on the rise. Think about you know, how you now might have, you might rent your car or use Uber rather than typically you know, purchasing it outright. You see the increase in leasing. You see there's a, there's a, there's a whole obviously path here which has taken us to today. Now, in the industrial and manufacturing space moving forward, this will become much more mainstream. And there's a couple things underlying that. The first is really IoT, the ability that you can have a product always connected, which means that when you produce a product and you hand it over to the customer or the consumer, you can have that increased vis visibility through its life cycle. That's the first enabler that allows you to move more to a service approach. Then, Sustainability is also going to drive us more and more to this, let's say, service or as a service economy because a product throughout its life cycle has more value than it used to have in the kind of use once, throw it away. A product, you'll be able to repair it, reuse it, refurbish it, recycle it, and as a result, you will constantly be calling into the question of what is the residual value of a product and how can I harvest that residual value, capture it and put it back in the production loop. So the as a service will be also a way of capturing the value, the circular value of a product throughout its life cycle. So sustainability is really having a strong imprint moving forward on manufacturing. Now, manufacturing is about producing goods, producing assets, and in the end, what we're seeing is that the nature of those goods and those assets being produced is changing. For one, effectively, we're moving quite simply from a linear uh, life cycle for products. Product used to be produced, then the consumer used to use it and then discard it. And we are moving to a circular life cycle for products. So what does that mean? That means effectively that when you'll be, as a business, designing or producing a product, you will be building it with the end in mind. You will make sure that it's, let's say, recyclable, circular at the end of its life cycle. And then the reciprocal is the same. The, the, the consumer using his product, he will increasingly feed his expectations to the business. More and more consumers or customers are asking for more circular products. And he will also feed it back into the production mechanism. So this circularity is definitely the main impact of sustainability moving forward. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think a lot of the sustainability efforts that have gone on uh, around the world have definitely had a bumpy ride. You know, a lot of them were quite difficult for consumers to sort of get involved with. When I think of 3D printing, I'm starting to see a lot more recycled materials come back in that sort of system. It's a really interesting area that I think consumers have still really fundamentally got to get their heads around. You know, we don't recycle nearly enough and that sort of thing. But when it comes to manufacture, I think one of the interesting areas um, sur surrounding that whole element is that consumer um, education piece. Sometimes um, we, we, we as individuals but also we as companies really need to sort of help people understand that it is easy to do it but also it's necessary. So future of work is, is, at, is the cornerstone of the discussion here because if we say effectively and if we assume that manufacturing is going through a momentous shift the next question is obviously, well, what is the workforce that we need to be able to, to drive this? Now, many people might say, yes, there's automation coming through, the workforce will increasingly be automated. But what we're really seeing here is that in the, in the end, having a skilled, trained workforce is really what's going to make the difference. Now, the question is, what should we skill, train that workforce in? And that brings us back effectively to the trend that we've seen over the past you know, couple decades, which is that manufacturing has a little bit been left behind when it comes to a talent attractiveness. Digital has been on the rise, really attracting a lot of talent here. So we've really built this new digital continent and people really have been yearning to work there for one. Then we've seen a lot of the talent in manufacturing decline as a lot of the manufacturing has shifted to Asia. 
But we're seeing a new renaissance in terms of um, effectively manufacturing in the West and uh, a lot of need in terms of new skills here. Mm -hmm. So there really is a need here uh, for new skills on, the manu on your manufacturing side. Mm -hmm. Future work's an interesting um, topic, I think, for a number of reasons. I think um, when I've spoken to younger demographics about, you know, their hopes and dreams and sort of the job that they want in the future, um, manufacturing isn't usually the first or probably even third on their lips and that sort of stuff. Um, I think that's for a few reasons. I think um, ultimately um, the, the shine has often been lost from manufacturing. It could be seen as you're working in a dirty factory and that sort of stuff. And you look around what's actually being created, which is digital campuses and things like that remote working from anywhere. I'm really excited about the future of what manufacturing can offer the youth, whether it's um, uh, remote work, but from a tele perspective. So you could be having, you know, doing this in your world, but actually activating something on a factory floor. That, that's the future of where we're sort of going. And the remote work of like, yeah, your factory could be on a visor in front of you. That's the reality of where we're going to be going in 20, 30 years. The, the, the security, the protocols that we've got to get through, that will take some time, but the technology is there. You can't build you know, a plane, you can't build a car, you can't build a consumer electronics device without collaboration. This is the effort of thousands of engineers working together, sharing information together. Now, today, as we look forward, there is just so much more we can do in this scope. As an industry, uh, when you think of the potential of the cloud, when you think of the potential of effectively uh, uh, collaborating across companies to share the right information about your products, your components, your spare parts, your customer needs, we're, we're really taking, and this is our endeavor at Dassault Systems, we're really taking collaboration to the next level. And by taking it to the next level, you also get much more control about what you're sharing and how you're sharing it. I think it's quite interesting the way that um, the, the future feels like it needs to be more operable and interoperable and shareable and that's thing but the realities of doing it is so difficult when you've got personal identifiable data you know that needs to be protected amazon just came out last week with um, some very interesting uh, new tools to help people do that essentially completely share data left right and center but they're going to withhold um, personal identifiable information but they'll use it so it comes down to really control and trust Are your people sort of ready for it? Because it is a push to go sort of harder and fast um, when a lot of two new technologies come sort of bare. That that for me really sort of is, it, there's, there are a lot of others, but those are the two sort of main markers. And I think that willingness to sort of push forward and push fast can often be incredibly powerful for companies. But at the same time, if your people aren't ready for it, then sometimes you can leave them in the wake and you, you cause more distress than sort of is needed. For me and sort of where manufacturing is going, I see a lot of advantage of like pushing fast, simply because you've got the tools that you need and now you can just figure out the right configuration for you and sort of move forward with the right, mis uh, with the right risk mitigation strategy, of course. Um, but yeah, what, what's your thought on that? Well, so the question is, you know, should companies stand still or, or move ahead and embrace this innovation? I think the answer is really, go back to the fun fundamentals, which is, you know, what should a company do? You know, why should it do it and how should it do it? And I, the answer will be different from company to company. So standing still or, you know, running ahead with innovation, fine. But the real question is, you know, what should I do? Is it appropriate for me? Why now? And how should I do it? And that's a difficult question to have. And I think answering that is really, you know, going back to the fundamentals of, you know, what you need to do as a company. Uh, there is a risk at doing nothing. The environmental, the environmental and economic and, you know, industrial uh, setting is changing so quickly that standing still could be the riskier, could be the much riskier option. Mm. But that doesn't mean that a company should absolutely tread ahead until it's figured out what exactly it should do. Looking forward um, in the future, um, new business models uh, and opportunities are emerging left, right and centre it feels like. Um, the multiverse and the metaverse for a lot of um, people seems to be where a lot of innovation is coming, certainly from new business models, um, a lot driven by 
uh, crypto blockchain and that sort of thing. That's the trust and the control elements coming through again. I, th I, th I see a lot of interesting um, green shoots coming from that sort of world and Web3. Um, it's certainly turning everything on its head. You know, you're, you're no longer using big players to sort of control your world or access a world that you don't have access to. In a sense, you're creating new opportunities. Then there's a lot of new, let's say, innovation, new form factors. Think about new, let's say, uh, uh, forms of uh, electronics, both in miniaturization and in, in, uh, in shape factor, uh, which is going to bring a lot of new, let's say, um, products, you know, products we could not have imagined before, in, you know, new form factors, uh, extended battery life, um, more performing systems which respond better to what the, the customer expects. So we're going to continue seeing this this trend of you know better products effectively, uh, more high tech products coming along the way, and so all this I think is really happening in the new year. So you know fast forward 2032, wow, it's going to be quite a world out there, and I think a better one for it too.